loud. Okay, here we go. Let's get started. This is where we left off yesterday. Um, I had just introduced intranets and extranets. Okay, so you know, private networks for employees, or in the case of extranets, authorized outsiders, stakeholders. How do we regulate access? We look at intranets and extranets, and again, just look at Black okay, Blackboard. This, this student learning management system can be considered, you know, one of either an intranet or extranet. How do we regulate access? What's that process? What is it? Username, passwords. So we're talking about authentication and identification. Remember, we authenticate to the system, and the system identifies identifies us. Once it identifies us, it provides us with authorized access to resources. Okay, so let's let's remember that. So when we look at VPNs, which is the next slide, if I can get my mouse over there and actually scroll. Okay, virtual private networks. A VPN is a tunneling protocol, is what they call a tunneling protocol, where a portion of the internet is kind of carved out. That's the way we think of it perceptually or virtually. However, what's really taking place is we're encrypting it end to end, okay. Virtual pr private networks do use encryption, and it is symmetric private key encryption. Remember, there are two types. There's public key and private key. Private key works when both parties know each other. So you'll see virtual private networks with organizations, Salesforce out in the field, things of this nature, because it's very easy for the salesperson to go to their you know, information technology services, whatever, and they set up the same password on each end. This is the same thing that you use on your Wi-Fi routers. Okay, on your Wi-Fi router, you'll put a password, and then to connect to your Wi-Fi router, of course, you know you're the same person, so you have a relationship with yourself. You have the same password, you put that in on your computer. That's in contrast to what takes place, or what's necessary with e-commerce, HTTPS, and other things, which is public key encryption. When you look at, say, Amazon.com, they can't have a relationship with every customer out there. So how do they provide secure communications? Amazon and other entities send out a public key, okay? It is not symmetric. So at your site, when you're, your computer, when you're placing an order, your computer will encrypt the data using the public key. The public key is put out there for everyone, hence the name public. But to unencrypt it or decrypt it, you need a, pro, a different key, okay? It's not symmetric. And only Amazon has that. So there's no danger whatsoever in Amazon putting out the public key because only they have the other key, the asymmetric key, to unencrypt the data. So there are two types of encryption, private key, which uses the same key on each end, and public key, which is asymmetric, which uses one key to encrypt the data and one key to unencrypt it, okay? So when we look at virtual private networks, that is private key encryption. Because again, who uses virtual private networks? Organizations. They know their employees. It's very easy for their information technology services, or whatever they call it, to put the key or share it with their sales force. Okay, moving on. Okay, so wired and wireless, we know that we know the difference. And again, the text groups fiber optic as wired. Um, we looked at topologies. I kind of moved some slides around last night. Um, so we understand the bus, the star, the mesh. I did add the slide for the ring network, okay? One of the things in the book doesn't really go into this. Ring networks are out there, okay? Ring networks can actually guarantee bandwidth to the parties. They were, it was used, um, NASA used it on the space station, things like this, so for real-time computing. What you do need, though, is another extra level of control here because we don't want one station just to continually transmit. We want to share, of course, the bandwidth among, amongst all the hosts. Typically, this is done with a token, okay? Hence the term token ring, to where a end station must possess the token to transmit. And once it's done transmitting, it'll pass the token on. So the token is just a software token that is transmitted between the, the end station, the hosts. And when, they, when, the, when an end station has the token, they can transmit. Okay, so looking at now wired media. Again, fiber optic cable is not wired, but we'll go along with the text and call it a wire. Um, when we look at wired, really we have twisted pair, and of course this is typically used, it's used for ethernet, it's, it's our phone lines. 
and then we have the coaxial cable that is our cable television lines. And because the coaxial cable, cable is much thicker than the twisted pair, its capacity, its bandwidth is much greater, okay? Um, it can carry a higher bandwidth on it. A note on the twisted pair. The twisted pairs, um, it is a pair of wires. Each wire, of course, has copper wound in one direction, and then it will be twisted together in the opposite direction. And this will serve to at least minimize or decrease the amount of radio frequency interference and electromagnetic interference. Again, whenever a current exists on a wire, it's going to create RFI and EMI. And this is a security, at least a consideration, because should you get close enough to the wire, you can detect the RFI and EMI and read the signals that are being passed along the wire. Of course, with fiber optic cable, photons, you cannot do this. Um, both twisted pair and coaxial cable can be tapped relatively easily, okay? All you need to do, of course, is insert a metal, something metal into it, and then, of course, then you can read that cable or connect it. You can connect a computer, of course, but you can also read the signal. Fiber optic cable cannot be tapped like that, okay? To tap a or add a device to fiber optic cable, you actually have to add a junction because you have to terminate it and then regenerate the signal. So just by inherently in that, fiber optic is more secure as well because you're going to be able to detect it. If someone's trying to tap your fiber optic cable, they're going to, at least for, for a while, stop the transmission. This is not the case of twisted pair. You can just stick a, a sensor, okay, a metal, metal probe into the wire and start reading what's on the wire. Fiber optic cable, you'd have to terminate it. So, of course, all transmissions stop. You're going to be able to detect this, so you're going to be, be able to detect that it, an attempt was made to breach the system. Okay, so here are just, of course, the, the text has this, um, the pictures of the various networking media. Okay, wireless. Wireless, of course, you know, we're looking at this as the future. You know, of course, Apple is. Apple, um, if you look at some of the newer MacBook Pros, things like that, they don't even have an Ethernet port. You know, wireless communications is what's required. Um, for the newer MacBook Pros, you actually have to buy an adapter. For the display port or the Thunderbolt to convert to Ethernet. It doesn't come standard with an Ethernet port. Um, so many, many companies are banking on wireless communications. Um, we'll, we'll see this with the Internet of Things. We'll, we'll see it kind of for the rest of this course. Um, of course, when we talk about wireless, we're talking about the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay. Um, so when we look at security, of course, it's the least secure of all the medias because it's out there. Okay, it's kind of a cloud, a perimeter. And if you're in that, within that perimeter, within that range, you can detect the signal. Whether you can decrypt it or use it is another matter. Um, typically, what we're talking about is, especially when we talk about high-speed communications, of course, there's infrared or infrared, however you want to pronounce it. But when we look at Wi-Fi, cellular, all these things, we're looking at the band between... 300 megahertz and uh, 3 gigahertz, okay? So most of our Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, all of these things fall within that range. And we know that the bandwidth is actually the capacity of the media, right? So we know that in the Wi-Fi spectrum, 5 gigahertz is going to have a higher bandwidth than 2.4, right? Because there are more transitions. And again, I presented this yesterday, but if I have a very slow wave, you know, that's going, you know, up, sinus wave, you know, up, down, up, down. I can only, you know, encode a one, a zero, a one. Whereas if I have a very high frequency rate um, wave that's going, you know, one, zero, one, zero, I can, of course, in the same amount of time, encode more information. So the higher the frequency, the higher the bandwidth. Okay, that's the wireless spectrum. I'm not going to say much about cellular. Um, everyone here is probably pretty familiar with it. Um, we know how we pretty much just move around and our calls are forwarded, um, you know, from tower to tower. Um, so I'm not going to say much about it. We've seen, of course, we've gone through 1G to 2G to 3G up to 4G or 4LTE, whatever people are calling it these days. Um, know that when we do talk about microwave and satellite, it is line of sight. So, of course, satellite communications are going to have a much better line of sight just because they're in a geosynchronous orbit um, high above the Earth. Okay, so they're going to be able to get to more areas. 
Okay, infrared is still out there, of course, TV remotes, but even um, if you look at, say, the Apple TV, their remote is using infrared, which is surprising considering that Apple wants to go everything Wi-Fi. So again, I'm not gonna say much here. We are gonna look at protocols kind of in depth, probably even deeper than what the text goes into. What is a protocol? Set of rules, okay? I introduced this you know, with a phone conversation. We have protocols for speaking on the, on the phone with one another. Um, courtesy, I don't speak when the other person's speaking because if both, people, both parties speak, of course the communications gets jumbled. But you can think about this also in terms of, say, our, our transportation system, our roads, because really this is a good analogy for the internet, okay? We have our road systems, which is, would be the physical internet, okay, the backbone, all these things. Um, and we have devices, you know, stoplights, things of this nature, so that, con that govern and control traffic. But there are also additional protocols that ex exist on top of this, okay? We have, I can take a right on red. I yield to traffic, okay, right of way, things of this nature. So just, just driving around, we have protocols. We have similar things that are necessary to govern transmission or communications on our networks. Okay, so we're gonna look at protocols kind of in, in detail here. It's also important to recognize standards. Okay, and I added, the textbook doesn't really go into, I added IEEE there and ISO, the International Standards Organization and the um, Institute for Electronics and Electrical Engineers. Um, these are pretty much the two governing bodies. So when you look at standards for say, the Terminator on a um, cable TV, okay, that goes into your TV, the RJ45 jack, your ethernet jack, your, um, your phone jack, or a traditional phone jack, okay? Of course, these all have to be standard because you wouldn't want to buy a phone or a modem or something and get home and go, oh, it's a different jack, okay? We need standards. I often use the example of that, you know, the electric, the electric um, three-prong plug. I know I can go to Target, Walmart, wherever, and buy a toaster, a coffee maker, whatever, and I know at the end of that, it is a two or, you know, two-prong plug that'll fit into that three-prong outlet on the wall, standards. We need standards um, for interoperability. Yeah. Um, and Staples the other day, I saw the weirdest um, power adapter on the, on the back of the computer. Yep. It wasn't your standard like trapezoidal um, prong plug in. Yep. It was instead it was a, a brown PC thing that you find on like some kind of yeah. like piano or electric piano or something like that. Hate them. Yeah. I've never seen that on a computer. Yeah, well, and think about that, you know, now we're talking about proprietary, proprietary connector. So what happens if you lose yours? You have to go back to that company and buy another one. Who is great at this? Apple. And they're going to charge you tons of money for those ap Apple adapters. Ridiculous. Um, anybody have it? Who has an iPhone, later iPhone 5 or later here? Have you priced out what those adapters go for for your phone? Don't lose your adapter. They're like minimally on Amazon for like a third party. They're like thirty or forty dollars. You buy from Apple, it's going to be seventy. Don't lose it. <laughs> I, sp I speak from experience because my wife did. Um, so, okay. So, what's that? The, yeah, the new iPads are going to go with the new the new connector. Yeah, and I forget what they call. Apple has names for all their connectors. Um, so, yeah. They talk about the cable with wall plug or just the cable? Just the cable. Because we saw that on Friday. Nice. So they've come down. Fantastic. This is when the iPhones, the 5s, first came out. So over time, yeah, the, the market has finally come around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, Ethernet. Um, Ethernet is still the standard wired local area network in organizations, and they do keep pushing the speed. Okay, um, and again, it's it's that it's you know Metcalf's law. There, they're going to keep doubling it about every eighteen months. Um, so, what I did want to present, I wanted to present the Ethernet bus protocol. Now, most, we, we need to recognize that Ethernet really has evolved. Most organizations are 
using this with switches in a star topology. But I want to get everyone thinking about what is required in terms of communications protocols. And CSMA CD is, is a great place to start. CSMA slash CD stands for Carrier Sense Multiple Access Collision Detect. So if we have several hosts and computers and devices on a bus, how do we govern or regulate communications so that everyone can communicate? Obviously, we can't just like on a phone or in a, in a big room, we can't have everyone talking at once. Okay? No communication or good communication will take place. But it becomes even more problematic in networking on a single line because if I put two communications on one line, it'll, they'll corrupt each other, right? It'll turn whether, you know, I, I'm not, we don't know which is high or low voltage, but a one will change zero to a one. If it's a high voltage, it'll corrupt it or vice versa, okay? So as soon as I have two communications on the same line, they corrupt each other and they're completely useless. So how do we govern communications? Okay, carrier sense, multiple access, I have multiple computers on here and I need to detect collisions. Okay, carrier sense, how do I sense? Well, what is the actual device? We haven't covered it yet, it's down a couple slides further. What's the actual device in a computer that connects to the network? What do we use? What do we plug the ethernet jack into? What, what card, yes, what is it? Network interface card. So every computer, okay, and even wireless will have a type of network interface card. So the network interface card has a port, which is that ethernet port on the back of the computer or wherever, wherever it is. And that's connected to the local area network. And it's sensing, okay? It can detect whether there's anything on the line, one, zero, things of this nature, okay? How can it do this? Um, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so now let's look at the example I'm going to have two computers communicate or transmit, okay? So computer A is going to begin its transmission at the same time that computer B begins its transmission, okay? First thing they would do, of course, is sense the line. Is anything out there? No. Okay, it's just, it's just a you know, steady state. So they think that no communication is taking place. But, of course, they are geographically distant from each other. So each one begins to transmit. And at some, at some point, and then the transmission goes both directions, at some point, the transmissions are gonna cross and reach the other computer. Now A, computer A is transmitting, okay? And it continually senses the line, all right? So it puts out a one on the line with its network interface card, but it also tests the line. I put a one on the line, what's the line state? It's a one. I put a zero on the line, what's the line state? It's a zero. So it knows there's no collision. But because computer B, at some point, this communications will propagate down here, okay, and the ones and zeros will become intermixed, at some point, they will detect a collision. Because computer A will put out a zero on the line, it'll test the line, hey, there's a one there. It must have been sent by another computer. Collision detect. So it's the network interface card that is also, that is carrier sensing, detects the collision, and once it detects the collision, it's going to stop transmitting and back off for a random amount of time. And it's random, okay? So these both computers will detect the collision. Both computers will back off, okay? And they'll just have a random number generator. One may back off for 10 milliseconds. One may back off for 20. And normally this is enough because communications are what we call bursty, okay? They're a small amount of information. So at some point, A will try to retransmit, and B is still waiting. It's backed off. It'll get its transmission out. B will wake up and transmit its communication. So this is the carrier set multiple access collision detect. So we need to understand that protocol and what is actually taking place because we need to understand the tools that it's the network interface card that is actually sensing the line and transmitting, but also, and it's actually the software that's doing the collision detect. Okay. So having said that, we now move into TCP IP, the transmission control protocol and the internet protocol. Quite often you'll hear these spoken about as the TCP IP stack, okay? Because it's a stack of protocols. And I'll show you the stack of protocols and I'll jump back to this slide. Um, here is the protocol stack. 
At the top layer, I have the application layer. Immediately beneath it is the transport layer, transport control protocol, TCP. Immediately below it is the network layer or the internet protocol. And then I have the media access that is at the data link and physical, okay? Up here at this application layer, and I'm going to come back to this slide, you're going to see quite a few other protocols. There are a lot of protocols that exist up at that application layer, okay? SMTP, simple mail transfer protocol. HTTP, of course, this is what our World Wide Web uses. You see that up in the browser. HTTP colon forward slash. And, of course, HTTPS, secure HTTP. FTP, file transfer protocol, okay? Telnet, which is, well, we're using something very, very simple with SSH, okay? Secure shell, okay? So we're using these now. Um, so let me jump back to TCP IP now. Okay, so recall what I said yesterday. I gave an example, you know, ESPN.com. Um, when I request a page from ESPN.com, my request goes off to them, and when they're sending their page back to me, they're not sending that entire page back in one big, you know, I, don't, I want to use the word packet, but that would be inappropriate, one big file, okay? That file from ESPN is going to get broken up at the TCP layer, okay, into segments. You don't need to know that and then get passed down to the IP, the network layer, it'll get broken up into packets, and then these packets will be sent out back to my computer, and these packets will be routed independently. One may go through Texas, one may, of course, it's coming from Connecticut, where the servers are, so one may go through New York City, one may go through Boston, it doesn't matter. They're gonna get routed to my computer, and they're gonna get passed up, so they're gonna hit my media access, get passed up to the IP layer, passed up to the TCP, where they're going to be reconstructed into that full web page, which is presented to my browser, which now shows me the entire file. Sorry there. Okay. So TCP IP is the de facto standard in LANs, the internet, everything. Okay. We're really conversed on this. This wasn't the case back in the 80s. We had many different um, protocols. We had Mac. We had um, Novell. We had a few others. Now pretty much everything is TCP IP. So again, here's a pictorial um, representation of what takes place. All communications will get passed down the stack. They'll get broken up into packets, and these packets will be routed independently. So here it is again. Now, I presented something yesterday. I spoke about synchronous communications. And I stated that the text, you know, it's, presents it kind of misleading and that it, it, you're, you're kind of led to believe that a computer with synchronous communications knows when that packet is arriving. No, it just knows that it is arriving. Okay. When we look at sync, and how, does it, how is it going to know that it's arriving? When we look at synchronous communications, which is the, you know, prevalent um, form of communication, how or what is required? We require connection setup. So let's think about this. How do we set up a connection between two parties that want to communicate? I'll give you an example first before I give you the TCP, um, the way it actually takes place. Consider two astronauts in space that want to set up a communications network. How do you think they do it? So I'll just pick Tom, Tom and Betty, okay? So that's our system. Our networking system consists of Tom and Betty. Tom starts. Betty, this is Tom. Do you read me? Okay. And think about that. Just in that one message, Betty, destination, this is Tom. So I provided my, my, my source address. I used a destination address. I, and I sent out a query. Betty, this is Tom. Do you read me? And what, does this, what do we know about this system at this point? What does Tom know? Tom knows that he sent the message. That's it. Has no idea if Betty's out there, if Betty heard it, anything. Okay. So Betty will reply, okay, hi, Tom, this is Betty, I read you. Okay. And again, Betty used what is destination and source. She provided a destination ad address and a source address. Both of those were contained in that communications packet. Now what do we know about the system? Well, Tom sent a message to Betty. Betty heard Tom. Betty knows Tom is out there and sent a message. 
but does, at this point, does Tom know Betty, or excuse me, does Betty know Tom heard her reply? Not until the third part of that handshake, when Tom replies back to Betty, hi, Betty, yes, this is Tom, I read you loud and clear. It takes three communications to set up a communications, a connected communications channel. Okay. So we can see that from a conceptual perspective. How does it really take place in TCP IP. Okay. Communications in TCP IP are expectational. Okay. How are we going to do this? We're going to do this with sequence and acknowledgements. Okay. So let's take a look at this. So computer A, this is my Tom here, okay, sends a message to B and it sends a first sequence number, one. When B responds, in my case, that was, you know, Betty responding, Tom, yes, this is Betty, I, I read you, okay? She sent a sequence of 100. She just generated this, an acknowledgement of two. And this is what I want you to focus on, okay? The acknowledgement of two is expectational and corresponds to that sequence number, okay? Think about this. Going back to Tom. Tom sends Betty, my sequence number is one. Betty sends back to Tom, her sequence number is 100, and the acknowledgement is two. What does that convey? The acknowledgement of two conveys that, Tom, I am now expecting your second packet. Expectational. And what can Tom infer? If you're expecting my second packet, you must have received my first one. So implicit in that message, I'm not only sending that I received it, but I'm telling the source what to send next because this is gonna be the basis of our windowing protocol. So now we see in this third one, when Tom responds again, sequence of two, sending what, of course, Betty was expecting, and what does he expect back from Betty the next time? 101, which implies, implicit, that I received 100. So you can see how this is taking place. Communications with these sequence and acknowledgement numbers is expectational. And what this facilitates now is windowing. If we had to sit around and wait for every packet, okay, I'm going to send you one packet, you send me one packet. I'm going to send you another packet. You know, if I waited for ESPN to send that web page packet by packet, it would never get here. During this connection um, setup, we're also going to, and I'm not going to show this, but we're going to set up how, how large the window is. Send me your next 100 packets. Now think about this for error recovery, okay? Um, I send out, you know, I'm a server now, I'll, I'll be a server here, and I send out 100 packets, okay? So say it's, you know, sequence number one through one through 100. The destination, maybe they got, you know, one through 49, but they didn't get 50, and they got 51 through 100. Somewhere out in the internet, a packet was lost. But this provides the very mechanism to recover from that. Because now the station, I have 1 through 49 and 51 through 100, I'm missing 50, right? Expectational. I'm going to send you an acknowledgement of 50, which means resend 50. So that error, recover, error recovery mechanism is built right into this expectational system using sequence and acknowledgement numbers. It's actually pretty slick. Okay. So I kind of jumped ahead. I did include... Um, IP headers and TCP headers, because it's kind of important to know, okay? Here's the communication, the application layer, the transport layer, the internet layer, IP layer, and the, the media access, the link physical layer. So again, when I send a request to ESPN for a web page, it starts here, it's my browser, okay? It gets passed down to the transport layer, it gets broken up into segments. These segments, I add a this, the TCP layer adds a header and a trailer, passes them down to the IP layer. The IP layer then adds its headers and trailers. It gets passed out, passes across the internet, hits ESPN servers, goes up to the IP, strips off those IP header and trailer, passes it up to the transport layer, strips off those, and reconstitutes the message here at ESPN. ESPN then generates their web page that they're going to send back to me passes it back down to the transport layer, breaks into the segments, 
adds a header and trailer, passes down to the IP layer, layer packets, goes out on the internet, the packets route independently, finally get back to my computer, get passed all the way up to my browser, where it's reconstituted, of course, and rendered on my browser. And I get to see whatever happened last night. Anybody following baseball playoffs, by the way? Um, okay, so that is the TCP IP protocol. And what I just described was connection management and how the TCP IP protocol stack works. Okay, now there are some other, um, just some other concepts that we should be aware of here um, or other technologies. Um, power over Ethernet, PoE. Okay. Um, why do we, why, do we need power over Ethernet? Okay, again, Ethernet, we're talking about local area network. Why would we want power over Ethernet? Well, recently we've seen organization and all organizations really move to, to voice over IP, okay? Again, there's that converged network, okay? VoIP phones are great, okay? But they do, of course, require power. Certain organizations cannot be without their communications hospitals, schools, things of this nature, okay? So if you have a power outage and you're just using VoIP, okay, voice over IP, and you just have soft phones, things like that, of course, if you don't supply power to the phone, you have no communications. So power over Ethernet packages power with that Ethernet cable so the phone can power itself. So hopefully at least you have a generator or something like that. Um, so you can have a, a device that can communicate and receive its power via, via the Ethernet cable. Um, I'm not going to talk much about phone line, power line, GHN. Um, you can create networks within the home or even broadband power line, we'll look at that in a minute, um, over other types of communications channels. Um, power line, they've done it for some time. Um, but you have to look at, say, the power using, you know, your electrical, you know, cables in your house for communication. Electrical cables have a lot of noise, right? And God forbid someone starts a, you know, a hair dryer or something like that in your house. Just the noise that's going to be on your power within your house is just going to just completely disrupt your communications. Um, it does have its uses, say, in broadband over power line, though. Broadband or pound. Again, consider, you know, the small shack, you know, sitting somewhere in South Dakota, okay? Hundreds, hundreds of miles from nowhere, okay? No cell service, no anything. Um, I don't want to spend the money to lay cable, okay? Who knows about satellite? You could go satellite. But if there's a power cable there to that shack, it is possible to send communications over that existing power line. Again, you do that though, there's a lot of noise in power, okay? So maybe for just low bandwidth type applications, simple control systems, it may work. Um, and you'll see this, great potential, okay? Yes, potential for del delivering broadband access. Um, again, there's so much noise on that power line. Um, God forbid you get lightning strikes, things of that nature, um, so. Um, Wi-Fi, again, is here. Um, we live with it every day. Um, note that it is a half duplex. We know what that is now. Communications. Okay, it's not full duplex to the to the router. Again, it's it simulates what takes place on the internet. What we just described with that TCP/IP connection setup, right? Half duplex, not both ways at the same time. Um, a couple things that have come out with Wi-Fi. Of course, 802.11 AC is now the fastest. It is a standard now. Um, there's some new things coming out, um, like smart beam technology. Has anybody seen that or researched that? The newer routers are using smart beam technology, um, which is both good and bad. Um, and what they allow to do, they, they have three antennas, minimally three antennas in them now. And they will actually triangulate your position in the house. So if you're on a tablet, a cell phone, or some direction and they will beam the communication that direction with a with a better signal right so they're able to discriminate they're actually able to selectively you know someone in three people in different bedrooms and actually separate their signals that way further decreasing the interference and the noise okay 
that's great. Your router knows where you are. Of course, anything that humans create can be hacked. Okay. So if someone hacks into your router, they know where you are in your house. Okay. So again, good, good and bad. Everything we do, every good application we devise, there are going to be ways to probably subvert its use. Um, WiMAX is an interesting thing. It's been speculated that this would, you know, really become per pervasive since the 90s. Um, WiMAX is a last mile technology. Okay, when I talk about last mile, it's actually Wi-Fi over a greater distance, even up to 50 miles, um, which would be great. Imagine if you had Wi-Fi over 50 miles. Um, but it's a last mile, so it would be competing against DSL, Time Warner. So technically, if we ever went this route, and WiMAX is here, um, clear channel. Um, it's, a, it's a, even in the area. You can get WiMAX in your home and get your broadband cable. I didn't mean to say cable there, but your, your broadband over WiMAX instead of Time Warner or, say, Verizon. Um, so it is here. It's great for city. Okay, something like that. If you start looking at like a 50 mile radius, and that, that's extreme, but even a 10 or 25 mile radius, um, think about that. And there are some phones that are dual with you know the cell phone and the WiMAX. Um, so New York City, things like that. If you could just have your broadband coverage with you wherever you are in the city, it's kind of cool. Um, essentially, no data plan necessary. So again, I'm not going to talk much about cellular standards um, or Bluetooth. Interesting, Bluetooth 4.0, you start looking at the speeds, you know, the range, Bluetooth 4.0 up to 200 feet. I mean, you leave your phone in your locker and you have music out on, you know, the the gym floor or wherever, um, 24 megabits per second, um, that's significant. Uh, again, with networking, recall, we're always talking about bits per second, okay? File sizes, we're talking about bytes per second. Don't make that error. Um, and when we talk about, there's something else kind of implicit here. Remember I spoke about, we presented serial versus parallel communications, right? And I said that really communications outside the computer takes place serially, right? This will, of course, show you outside the computer, bits per second, okay, kind of remind you it's a serial stream. Um, other things are coming, Wi-Fi direct. So using Wi-Fi without a router, which is very nice, get Wi-Fi speeds. Uh, great for, Wi-Fi actually has a higher bandwidth. Um, in some cases than wired systems. Um, and you're seeing this now in music, in-ear monitors, um, so professional audio. They're able to use Wi-Fi and get higher fidelity on stage, which is, which is kind of cool. Okay, I'm not gonna talk about these, you know, niche technologies. Um, I haven't, you know, they're, they're out there. I I'm not really seeing implementations of them. So, so read about them, know that they're there. Zigbee, Z-Wave, same thing. I'm not going to say much about them. Uh, we do need to understand, again, it is that network interface card that connects to the network, okay? Every computer will have a physical address, and that physical MAC address, media access control address, will be located on the network interface card. Um, <laughs> And we're going to look at that more and more, um, really next week when we really get into the internet. We'll look at the distinction because we have physical addresses and we have logical addresses. Okay, um, the physical address is the MAC address. The logical address, when we talk about, you know, the internet, we talk about IP addresses. You know, one two four dot two four dot something. That's logical. That's assigned. Okay, and then there's another. There's a further mapping because we also have URLs, Uniform Resource Locators, okay? And of course, they require the domain name system. So I've, while I've been, I've been glossing over a lot of the details, um, I stated, you know, what actually happens, you know, I go off to ESPN.com to get my web page. What actually happens, okay? If I type ESPN.com in my browser's location bar, what actually happens? First thing that needs to be resolved, what is ESPN.com? What's its IP address? That'll go off to the no domain name server. 
and it comes back with an IP address. And when it went off to that domain name server, it did go down the TCP IP stack. So it went application, TCP, IP, media access, out to the domain name server, back to my computer, back up, media access, IP, transport control, application, because my browser needs to know that. Um, so now I have an IP address, and it's going off to ESPN.com, but that's a logical address, and that requires mapping again down the line to what is the actual physical address of the server. So think about this. Next time you go to a site, you know, and you type in a URL, that's going to the DNS. It's coming back. And then at some point, it has to be resolved back from a logical IP to a physical address. Connection setup, one, two, three. Then communication starts. So think about how quickly this is all occurring, how many communications between the domain name server and the actual server you want before you, and, and how quickly you get your web page. And it's, it's pretty amazing, actually. Uh, so modems. Modems are modulators, demodulators, OK? Because when we look at a lot of our communications lines, some of them, <coughs> DSL, phone lines, cable, you know, um, we're still looking at um, analog signals. So we do need to go between digital and analog. We do need to perform that conversion. OK. So. Uh, other networking hardware, so now we're talking about intermediary devices, and you, and you don't need to know some of this. A switch is a layer two device, router, um, you know, IP layer. Um, switches work with the physical address, routers work with the logical, the IP address. Um, it's kind of if you're in the system and network administration program, you do need to know that. Um, bridges use, br connect two LANs together. Gateways will connect different networks together. Okay, so a bridge you can think of, you know, just a road on a bridge on our road system. They connect two like-size, you know, roads. Okay, two highways. Um, whereas a gateway is going to connect two disparate technologies. And that's essentially it. Um, remember what I said though. Um, this is the textbook presents. Um, Multiplexer combines transmissions from several different devices. Okay, what's the true definition of a multiplexer or multiplexing? It is creating multiple logical resources from a single physical resource, and this happens all the time. When you look at the internet backbone, I have a single fiber optic cable, but I have a lot of communications going on on it. Right, conversations, communications between a lot of different sources and destinations. Right. So I'm creating logical connections, many, using a single physical address. Um, you can think of just your Ethernet port on the back of the computer here, right? I have one connection to the Ethernet, but I'm running an email you know, client, I'm running a browser, I'm running FTP. So I have multiple logical connections on a single physical connection. It's the true definition of multiplexing. Um, so that's it. Look at this. Right? A whole seven minutes early. Um, that's it. Have a great week. If you have any questions or anything, let me know. Bless you.